So, uh, Captain Watson, thank you so much for, for joining me. Uh, it, it would be brilliant to get started with a little bit of your journey into the world of activism. When did the kind of the, the oceans particularly become a, a focal point for you? Was, was there an early memory that you, that you became aware of the, the plight of, uh, of the oceans? Well, I was raised in an um, eastern Canadian fishing village uh, on the Passamaquoddy Bay, and, and uh, so I was, you know, raised right by, by the ocean. And, uh, but uh, one incident that uh, sort of got me on the road that I'm on right now is that in, when I was 10 years old, I spent the summer swimming with a family of uh, beavers and having a wonderful time. But the next summer, when I was 11, I went back, found out there were no beavers, and trappers had taken them all during the, the winter. And that made me quite angry, so that winter I began to walk the trap lines and uh, free the animals and destroy the traps. And so I guess I've been doing the, the same thing ever since. <laughs> <laughs> and and do, you, do you remember there being a, a particular kind of, um, the, the first port, port where you, point where you got some backlash from people? Was it as early as those, those kind of those freeing those beavers? Well, yeah, I got a lot of, uh, got in a bit of trouble. Uh, for instance, I shot some kid in the rear end with a BB gun who was about to shoot a bird. And uh, uh, I know Dixie Lee Ray, uh, who the former governor of, uh, now deceased of Washington, D.C., she wrote a book called Trashing the Planet. And she said, evidence of Watson's insanity can be found that when he was uh, 12, he shot a boy in the ass with a BB gun who was about to kill a bird. Any boy who, uh, you know, would shoot a, uh, another boy to protect a bird has to be insane. And my response to her was, in my hometown, every kid shot every other kid with a BB gun. I just happened to have a practical reason to shoot the kid I did. <laughs> I, think, I think sort of, you know, moving, moving that journey forward and having founded uh, Sea Shepherd, at what point did you realise that that kind of approach uh, was, ha you know, was, having a, was having an impact? You know, was it the, the first moment that you stopped a, a, a whaling fleet? I was the youngest founding member of Greenpeace. Uh, that was in 1969, and I left Greenpeace in 1977. The reason being is that uh, I felt, you know, Greenpeace uh, being a protest organization, that protesting was very submissive, and uh, it's like, please, please don't kill the whales, and all you do is take pictures and hang banners. So uh, I set up Sea Shepherd to intervene, not to protest. And uh, at the same time, I developed a strategy called aggressive nonviolence. We're not going to hurt anybody, but we're going to aggressively interfere. And uh, that's what we've been doing. We shut down hundreds of illegal operations and we haven't uh, killed or injured anybody. We haven't sustained any, any injuries. So, uh, you know, that's our approach, really, which I think is somewhat unique. And uh, Sea Shepherd, which began as an organization uh, with myself, is now a global movement with, uh, you know, in 42 countries. And uh, I think that's what makes it strong. I mean, you can stop an individual, you can shut down an organization, but it's pretty impossible to shut down a movement. The, the kind of the role of, if you like, persuading the general public, do, do you see that as sort of an important part of Sea Shepherd's work? I know you've... Uh, been heavily involved in the, the media and, and documentary making over the years. Is that a kind of crucial part, do you think, of, of Sea Shepherd's work? Well, I think so. I was um, a communications major uh, in the early 70s and uh, very much influenced by, we had a guest lecturer uh, named Marshall McLuhan, and uh, he was the one who really explained the nature of the media culture to us. Uh, and uh, that the medium or the media is more important than any of the message that it conveys. And so what you really have to understand that and then deliver your message according, accordingly. I mean, it's no uh, accident that Greenpeace uh, was uh, established by journalists and columnists and writers and communications people. And uh, right from the very beginning, we understood that the most powerful weapon on the planet is the camera. And uh, in fact, if it if you don't take a picture of it, then it didn't happen. Uh, we're seeing that more and more. I mean, one of the things we're talking about right now, you know, is uh, how, where's this all this police brutality in the United States coming from? Well, it's always been there at this time, and now it's filmed, so now it becomes real. And uh, I'd, I'd love to get your view on how, how things have evolved, because obviously when you first started Sea Shepherd back in 77, the... Uh, the the media was kind of a you know a set of fairly narrow channels you know the TV the press etc and of course now we've got social media and everyone's got a phone in their hand and it's so much easier perhaps to access millions billions of eyeballs if you like on a message but there's also so many conflicting messages I'd love to get your your perspective on that 
Well, in one way, it's easier, but another one, I remember when we were dealing, for instance, in the United States or Britain, where there's only there were only two or three networks, uh, then, you know, you reached a lot more people there, uh, you know, with your message, with one story. Um, you know, when a harpoon was fired over our head uh, in 1975 uh, off the coast of California, when we were interfering with the Russian whaling fleet, uh, that was picked up by CBS and went global. Uh, we didn't have to be concerned about, uh, you know, finding this media or whatever. It just took off. Um, back then, uh, Robert Hunter, who is a co-founder of, uh, of Greenpeace, uh, he coined a word called mind bombs. We got to drop mind bombs, which today would be going viral, you know. So we understood what that was back then. You know, we also understood that, uh, you know, every story, media story has to have one of four elements, and that's sex, scandal, violence, or celebrity. And you have to put those in there to make Make yourself a story. If you have all four elements, you got yourself a super story. You know, when we took Bridget Bardot to the ice flows off of Newfoundland to protect seals in 1977, that guaranteed us the cover of Perry Match and Bunta and magazines all over the world. So the power of celebrity, you know, you have to harness that kind of thing. So, um, you know, so we learned all, all, all of those lessons. I mean, today, for instance, I have a whole panel or advisory board of celebrities. You know, uh, we, we had Sean Connery, we have uh, Pierce Brosnan and Christophe Lambert and, uh, oh, geez, Martin Sheen. We have Richard Dean Anderson and um, oh, Christian Bale. I mean, so what, what that means is in the media culture, we've got two James Bonds, we've got Batman, we've got... <laughs> uh, uh, Captain uh, Kirk, we've got to MacGyver, we've got the ha Highlander. We can't lose. I mean, people are, identify with that. For instance, uh, in making films, uh, somebody asked me the other day, well, I don't understand why Seaspiracy is so big when I made a film about this and the science was perfect and everything else. I said, well, the problem is statistics and facts don't sell. You need a, a story. Rob Stewart's Sharkwater was successful because it was his story. Lucy and Ali Tabrizi's story is Seaspiracy. Diane Fossey and Gorillas in the Mist, they're stories and people can relate to stories. That's the art of communications. It's not just, you, you, if you're just giving facts and figures and statistics, that, that's not a story. In fact, it's very boring to most people and uh, it's unfortunate, but that is the reality of, uh, of the media culture. And also you have to understand it, it's constantly evolving. You know, now we have social media and such and such like that and, you know, and you have to get message across in a completely different way. In the 1950s, for instance, the television, the average television commercial was two to three minutes. Uh, the average interview was five or six minutes with a politician. Well, that's now gone to 30 second commercials and 10 second news clips, you know. If you were to take somebody from the 1950s, bring them here today and show them a TV commercial, they, they wouldn't even know what, what was that all about, you know. Or what did that politi What do you say? Did, you know, you know. Uh, today, uh, this is how we've evolved in the media, putting a lot of information into these sound bites and everything else. But it was very alien concept in the, in the beginning, and it's a media that defines the culture. I mean, we went from uh, photography to uh, silent films to radio to color sound films to television to documentaries to internet I mean all of this is a constant evolution and you have to really take advantage and understand that media that you're working with the most powerful media today is film is documentaries and even more so motion pictures if you get your message into a motion picture now you're really making some headway I mean that began when we saw Three Mile Island and the impact that had on the nuclear industry um, and you know films about climate change uh, when you fictionalize these things, in a way, it's the easiest way to get the truth across is through fiction, which sounds a little strange, but, uh, you know, that's what gets people's, people's attention. Yeah, that 100%. And the, I'm going to go back to that point that you made there, and it would be remiss of us not to talk about Seaspiracy, but that point you made about how powerful documentaries uh, are uh, right now. And particularly in this moment, perhaps there's a, a, a huge amount of people sat in front of Netflix, etc. cetera. Um, and and Seaspiracy has obviously captured a, a huge amount of people's uh, attention in the right way. Uh, how do we, I, I suppose... There's been backlash, and and I'd love to talk to you about that already, um, particularly around the kind of NGO space and people's people's various views on that. I, I'd I'd love to get your view on how we make sure that that message isn't kind of lost in the the the, the very quick moment of a viral kind of uh, sensation. 
Yeah, you have to build on it. Um, we, the backlash, we expected the backlash, always expect the backlash. Um, you know, there's there's always, they're going to throw things at you. If, I mean, we're up against billion dollar a year industry, you know, and hugely subsidized industries like the fishing industry and everything. You have to expect a backlash. And they're going to throw all their scientists, which I've, many of whom work for their industry, I call them biostitutes. They're going to throw it at you. But it's the same with climate change. You'll find scientists who agree with you, scientists who are going to be against you. You really have to follow the money and just see what's motivating them really to, to, to find that. But I'm not really concerned about, uh, you know, that kind of backlash. In fact, I think it's good. Uh, it gets people talking about it. Um, people remember those things. It's that old thing, it doesn't matter what they say as long as they spell your name right kind of thing, <laughs> you know, gets their attention. Or as what Oscar Wilde once said, uh, the only thing worse than being talked about is not being <laughs> talked about. And uh, so, you know, the Seaspiracy is a success. It's uh, it was trending in the top ten and number one in many countries, and that's what's really important. And people remember those things. They, for instance, uh, some of the nitpicking and uh, about the so-called science and the thing like uh, one of the things that I caught my attention says, well, you know, this film says in 2048 the fishing industry is going to collapse. That's been debunked. We've talked to scientists about this, and they disagree completely. But when you look at those debunking things, it's like it's only going to be diminished by 88 <laughs> percent so that's what they're saying so does it really matter whether the fishing industry collapsed in 2048 or 2078 it doesn't really matter personally i think that's being highly optimistic it's on it's collapsing now i think by 2030 it'll collapse and it's not just because of overfishing it's also because of, of pollution and all you know all sorts of other issues climate change and everything else like that it's all contributing to it so i, to, I, I say 2030 and of course people say well you don't have any scientific uh, evidence to back that up and i said no I don't, but I have observation. I've sailed around the world. I've spent, you know, a half a century seeing these things diminish and seeing the trend. And, um, you know, that's that's what I'm going with. I am, I'm not going to go with all the facts, figures, and statistics to, to back up this because people can always find facts and figures and statistics to back up anything they want to say. It'd be, it'd be good to just understand a little bit about your, and I appreciate there is, there's, there's many, many years worth of seeing these things firsthand, but what are some of those kind of things that you've seen that where you really started to think, you know, there is, there is substantial seismic uh, change going on and collapse going on in our oceans? Well, I've seen diminishment, but even worse, adaptation to diminishment, accepting that. The fishing village that I was raised in in eastern Canada is no longer the fishing village it was in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you know, one of the things in the 50s that we did not eat were mussels. They were considered to be quite dirty. Uh, you know, we had scallops, we had clams, we had all these things, but we don't have that anymore. Now you go to a restaurant in my hometown, you get mussels. I, I even said, well, why are you serving that? Well, you know, everything else is too expensive because scarcity means you know, greater prices and that. Uh, we, the, cod, the cod fishery uh, in the North Atlantic has collapsed. The um, orange ruffy fishery off New Zealand has collapsed. Uh, we're looking at the diminishment of every single commercial fishery on the planet. And this adaptation where, you know, Pollock, for instance, which I remember in the 60s, 70s, nobody would eat Pollock, didn't have any taste, but now they've, uh, oh, well, let's just put a little uh, scent on it and put a red stripe down it and call it uh, crap, <laughs> you know, cerema. Uh Turbot. Nobody ate turbot back in the 50s and 60s. I mean, that was considered, uh, the term was used, garbage fish. You know, it's useless. Now, of course, you go to a restaurant in Paris or New York and you can get turbot on the menu because you don't have cod, you don't have black cod, you don't have all these other things. The Atlantic salmon populations collapse, the wild ones, that is. Um, all over the world, we're seeing this diminishment, and it's there. And... Um, so to say that uh, this isn't happening is really delusional. What do you see as the the crucial elements that we need to get in play to really, I suppose, stop the destruction and stem this this kind mm. of tide of where we're at? What what is it that that we need to do and 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 individually, but also collectively? Well, in 2015, I, when I addressed the climate change conference in Paris, uh, COP21, uh, I said that you know, the oceans are dying. If we're, the oceans regulate climate. If you want to address climate change, then you have to heal the ocean. And how do you do that? By leaving it alone. Shutting down all the heavy gear industrialized shipping operations, shut down the super trawlers and the, the 100 mile long long lines and gill netters and the purse saners, shut them down and uh, give the ocean the opportunity to heal the damage that we've done to it. You know, for hundreds and hundreds of years in Polynesia, 
the uh, ka, the shamans would have this thing called kapu. Uh, there are regulations that would uh, protect the environment. For instance, uh, a, a bay in Bora Bora or Hanama Bay in, say, Hawaii, they would declare the bay kapu for 20 years. Nobody catches, nobody goes fishing in that bay for 20 years. If anybody was caught fishing, it was a death penalty. And people say, well, that's a little extreme. Not from their point of view. They understood that if the fish disappeared, they would die. It was a question of survival. Today, there are no kapu areas anywhere in the world. People will say, well, we got marine refuges and sanctuaries. Yeah, that's where the poachers go. <laughs> that's where they know they're going to find fish. And those are being 600,000 sharks a year are taken out of the Galapagos Marine uh, Reserve. And that's supposed to be a sanctuary. You know, J Japan until recently were killing whales in the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary. Uh, so, you know, Rayathon, that's a fish finding company, their motto for their fish finder is, the fish can run, but they can't hide. And that's the problem. They can't hide. They can't get away from us. And we're, the, the numbers of fish being taken from the sea every year is in the trillions. It's just, we have no idea. Uh, we kill 65 million animals a year uh, for the meat industry, but far, far more is, are killed in the ocean. And also that 40% of all of the fish caught from the sea isn't eaten by people. It's fed to chickens, it's fed to pigs and to fur-bearing animals, to domestic salmon, to house cats. Uh, so it's, uh, even when you eat a hamburger, you're, you're eating a fish. Do, do you see any sign of there being any kind of government around the world that is taking this seriously enough? Well, you know, since 2015, well, actually beginning in 1999, we began a partnership with the Galapagos Marine, uh, w with the Galapagos National Park in Ecuador. And now, since 2015, we now have uh, partnerships with numerous African and Latin American countries. So, you know, Gabon, Tanzania, Namibia, Santome, uh, Sierra Leone, Togo, Gabon, Gambia, uh, and in Latin America with Peru, with uh, Panama, Colombia, and Mexico. What that means is we provide the... Um, the resources and the volunteers, the ships and that, and they provide the authority. And this partnership is working pretty good. We've arrested and seized of 65 poaching vessels in African waters over the last year and a half. And uh, so there are countries that are, are seeing that something has to be done. Unfortunately, they're not the big industrialized countries who are the problem, really. Uh, they, uh, the, the, you know, what the fishing industry likes to do is to let everybody think that the fish that's on their plate is coming from some small little fishing boat with hardworking fishermen on board, and they're out there in the going out early in the morning and weathering the all the conditions to bring you that fish. But that's not the case. We're talking about massive super trawlers and nets that are so big you could put three school buses into them. Uh, we're talking about 100 mile long line nets and gill nets and ever. In fact, it is this industrialized fishing operations that are the biggest threat to the survival of artisanal and indigenous fishing uh, communities around the world. Uh, so, you know, this isn't about uh, stopping a fisherman out of the Gambia from catching fish. This is not about stopping uh, in indigenous peoples in Alaska from catching fish. This is about about stopping highly mechanized industrial fishing operations with their hundred million dollar ships. This is what is this is the real threat to the ocean. Absolutely, and that that image that you that you sort of mentioned there that is perpetuated by the well, it's, it's also in the meat, the dairy industry, the 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 fish industry of this kind of idyllic small holding almost that is producing these uh you know this food for us is um is absolutely kind of a a, a misnomer and a, a misdirection the 100 percent and and it's i think work like sea spiracy the work of sea shepherd uh this the things that are posted on social media i think is uh in, in many ways shining a light in the right areas my my fear is i suppose that the way that algorithms serve these things up to us is that us us in the sort of the vegan community and the activist community kind of can think that we're winning because we're seeing a lot of these images um, and and do you think that that's that's a bit of a, a danger if you like that we're not shouting loud enough we kind of think the work's done because we've seen a lot of vegan posts that week well, yeah, that is a case where, you know, we get exposed to the things that, you know, we already believe in in that way. That's one of the reasons that we, you know, go to Netflix and get our documentaries on there. That's one of the reasons we did the Whale Wars show, to reach people who who are not involved in, in, in that community. In 2005, I went to the networks and I said, look, the biggest show on Discovery right now is a bunch of men going into a very cold, very remote area of the planet to catch crabs. 
I can give you men and women going to a far more remote, colder area to save whales. It has to be more compelling than catching crabs every week. And so they went for it. So we reached millions of people which uh, who were exposed to this who would not have otherwise uh, have seen it. And so, yeah, and that when you're de dealing with the mainstream media, like I said earlier, you have to give them sex scandal, violence, and celebrity. And uh, you, know, you give them a story. And uh, then you get your message across. There's no point really constantly uh, preaching to the converted and that. And also you have to be open to, I, I, you know, you, everything's not going to change overnight. I'm, I remember when uh, the Beyond Burger and the Impossible Burger came out uh, with Burger King and now it's with McDonald's, I think, and everybody was saying, well, this isn't vegan. And, and I said, you forget the, the Impossible Burger isn't for vegans. It's for people who meet, eat meat who are given an alternative. It's not catering to the vegan community. <laughs> and so this is a transitional thing. Accept it for what it is. And, you know, people understand, oh, you know, they're being introduced to a plant-based sort of thing. And then they'll say, well, we don't like the word plant-based. Well, it doesn't matter what you like. Yeah. <laughs> it's what we're trying to get people involved. And uh, everybody's not going to jump in and suddenly say, I'm a vegan and everything. But it's interesting, uh, the uh, evolution of veganism. You know, you know, in 1979, I made all the ships vegetarian. And in 1999, they all became vegan. But I remember back in the 70s and the 80s when nobody even knew what a vegan was, you know. Thought it was from the planet Vega or something like that. It was like, and uh, I remember when vegetarianism was considered like extremely radical, you know. And um, so things have changed, and it's much more exciting. It's a very fast-growing movement. People are coming around, and uh, we we should encourage them. We shouldn't be prostatizing on on every little thing, you know. And when somebody says, "Well, I only eat meat once a week," well, good. Good. That isn't a bad thing. That's a good thing, you know. And just encourage them. But you know, when you when you you know, you people are a bunch of um, barbarous whatever like that. That that isn't gonna get people going, you know. So I mean, I, I've actually uh, been lectured by some vegans who are all, almost make me want to go out and order a steak, you know, because of their their attitude on it. But uh, and it's just it's almost like people are always ready to find something a gotcha moment for people. I remember I was in a, a, a airport having a, a lunch and this woman came up and she says, "Oh, I'm really shocked that you're eating a hamburger." I said, "Well, actually, it's not a hamburger; it's a veggie burger, and it's right here on the menu." Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> Two days later, that woman put on Facebook, "I caught Paul Watson eating a hamburger in the airport." See, so they want to find ways to you know, to bring you, to, to take you down for whatever reason, I have no idea, but uh, I think people get some sort of satisfaction in, in that, maybe feeling superior or something. I'm not really sure. But uh, the thing is, is we've got to stop being so judgmental uh, with everybody. You know, you don't have to be vegan to be on a Sea Shepherd ship. You have to be vegan. You have to be vegan while you're on the ship. You don't have any other choice, really. And that actually introduces an awful lot of people to veganism. And uh, people who have come on and said, wow, I didn't die. In fact, I feel better than I did when I came on board, you know. They had to discover that, and they did. Uh, sea Shepherd is not a vegan organization. We're not even an animal rights organization. We're a marine conservation and enforcement anti-poaching organization, which happens to practice veganism that's what we are an important distinction to make yeah absolutely and i love this point about bringing people in because i think it's you know it, it becomes a point of debate within the the sort of quote-unquote vegan community certainly i've had many episodes where i've debated long and long and hard with various guests about uh, the commercialization of veganism and so on and so forth and where it has a place and uh, I, I love your point that ultimately what are we trying to do you know we're trying to bring people in you know and that 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 i think is the key point well we have to commercialize it you have to bring it into the into the, you know to the to the culture it has to or else you know it'll just be a fringe thing that nobody's really gonna be uh, but uh, it's amazing just how uh much companies like beyond meat and have have actually uh grown and now there's a alternative seafood products you know like shrimp and stuff which aren't really shrimp and everything like this i think this is uh you know this is all a very positive thing and uh there's you know i even have a, some people say well and now they're developing uh uh this meat which isn't real meat which isn't real meat <laughs> what i mean is it's grown from cell tissues in laboratories and uh my answer to that is are we killing any animals? No. Well, then what's the problem? <laughs> you know, and that. 
I mean, it's getting a little bizarre now. I heard that now you, they're, they're actually talking about uh, cloning the uh, cells of celebrity people. I mean, it's almost a form of cannibalism, <laughs> but, you know, they can do whatever they want. There's, my, my problem is that I'm, uh, you know, I just, as long as it alleviates suffering, as long as it stops killing, uh, taking lives, as long as it isn't damaging the environment, then alternatives are a good thing. For, for folks who, who perhaps don't know, maybe haven't watched Whale Wars or come across the work of of Sea Shepherd and what is the the, the and we're talking specifically about uh, sort of the the whaling fleets if you like the, the Japanese whaling fleet what's the the scale of that problem I know there's obviously it has to be done for research purposes and things now and it's not you know that those kind of things what is the scale of it is it still something that is very prevalent and very much part of Sea Shepherd's work well, whales are never killed for research purposes. Yeah. Research is always uh, an excuse for it. But I would say since we began in 1975, we've seen the reduction of whaling by 95%. It's only about 5% left of what it was back then. Uh, in 1975, we were fighting um, Spain and Portugal and Chile and Peru and Australia, Korea. We're all whaling nations. Uh, and now... Uh, Norway, Japan, and Iceland, although Iceland hasn't killed any whales for the last three years. So as of two years ago, no whaling has taken place in international waters. It's now restricted to the territorial waters in Norway, Denmark, and, uh, and Japan. So we made an incredible uh, progress in our efforts to, to stop whaling. And uh, I've always wanted to see in my lifetime the complete eradication of commercial whaling, and I, I think that that's going to be a, going to be achieved. That's why we're turning our the bulk of our attention right now to overfishing, illegal fishing, unregulated fishing, and uh, and addressing that, which actually kills more whales and dolphins than whaling directly because of the bycatches in the nets. Every year, 10,000 dolphins die in the fishing nets of the French trawling fleet alone, and so that's why we have a ship in the Bay of Biscay tackling that right right now so it's uh we have to be concerned about all life in the ocean from phytoplankton to the great whales to me one of the most pressing concerns is that since 1950 we've seen a 40 percent diminishment which is backed up by scientific american study uh, that uh, says that's uh, there's been a 40 percent diminishment in phytoplankton populations that's extremely worrisome because phytoplankton provides 70 percent of the oxygen in the air that we breathe far more than trees and plants on land and if phytoplankton dies out in the sea then we die we don't live on this planet with the without plant phytoplankton it's absolutely necessity of uh, necessity for life on this planet it is the basis of life and uh, so this is one of our big concerns right now. And what is phytoplankton? Uh, the reason for the diminishment is the destruction of whales, dolphins, seabirds, and whatever, because they provide the nutrient base in their feces for nitrogen and iron, which feeds them. They're like the farmers of the ocean in that respect. And uh, of course, phytoplankton is also being uh, damaged by uh, commercial exploitation. They want to take millions of tons of the stuff out of the uh, sea in order to render it into a cheap protein paste to feed to domestic animals. And also it's been uh, uh, chemical and plastic pollutions and all sorts of other problems there. So really what we're doing, we're, we're in the process of killing our oceans. And as I say all the time, if the ocean dies, well, then we all die. The commercialization aspect, the overfishing, how do you go about stopping that i imagine it's it's very difficult to prove that a particular boat has done what it's done or or is you know forgive my naive question but how how do you go about stopping overfishing outside of a government putting a law in place and even then i imagine it's probably pretty difficult to enforce well, right now we are interviewing. We board vessels in the waters of the countries that we're working with, and uh, if we find violations, then they're arrested. But um, really, it, it comes about with uh, it has to be an international action in order to stop all of this unregulated and illegal fishing operations and to uh, bring a lot of these fisheries into compliance with, uh, you know agreements which the international community can uh, can agree upon but uh, and the recognition that we have to shut it down and if that doesn't happen it's going to collapse and uh, so we really have to do everything we can to try and get the the message out governments have to act you know and they for instance the pentagon in the united states is well aware of the threat they see it as a security issue 
if this collapses, then this is a major security issue for the United States and for the world in, in general. So hopefully that'll, you know, there'll be more and more awareness of it and actions being taken. That's why I think that films like Seaspiracy uh, and the controversy that it's uh, provoking are extremely valuable towards, uh, towards that end. And we just constantly have to keep pushing it, pushing more in films. When it comes to films, for instance, you know, we did Sharkwater with Rob Stewart. There was Racing Extinction with Louis Soyles, The Cove with Louis Soyles, uh, the uh, Sea of Shadows on the Vaquita campaign, uh, Chasing the Thunder. These things all are just one after another. We have to keep producing them. We have to keep, uh, in fact, we were able to, we had Richard Attenborough's, uh, I mean, uh, David Attenborough's uh, crew on board the, uh, uh, the one of our vessels last year for, and that was on the BBC. We're getting into that kind of mainstream media there, and um, so it's um, you know that we just have to keep pushing on it in, in that respect. And I also say that the strength of, a, of an ecosystem is in diversity. Therefore, the strength of any um, movement has to be in diversity. So whether that approach is education, litigation. Uh, or direct action or litigation, it doesn't really matter as long as it's all working towards the same end, everybody working together, using their skills, their abilities, to the best of their ability to try and bring these changes about. So whether people be lawyers or teachers or journalists, it doesn't really matter as long as they're making that effort in that, in the, in that direction and working together towards it. Even if they're not working together, it doesn't matter as long as they're working towards the same objective. Have, have you seen that the... the, the and I'll say, say this sort of loosely, but the, the general public that you have encountered in, in their kind of contact with Sea Shepherd, have you found that there's been a generally uh, more positive reception to Sea Shepherd over the years, you know, going from, you know, where some people might have labelled the organisation kind of eco-terrorists and these kind of things. Have you seen the, the likes of these documentaries, Chasing the Thunder, Sea Shepherd, etc., uh, sorry, um, Sea Spiracy, etc., et starting to switch the public mindset to actually say, do you know what, these, these folks are doing some incredible work in trying to protect and conserve our oceans? Well, 20, 30 years ago, we wouldn't find governments working with us. Mm. Um, today, one of our captains is the former chief of staff of the Italian Navy, an admiral. So we're attracting a lot of people like that. Uh, the name calling and uh, the attacks never bothered me. Um, you know, every time I was called an eco-terrorist, I, I would just simply say, I've never worked for Monsanto, so I don't, I don't really qualify. But um, you, you have to be uh, undeterred by those kind of criticisms and recognize where they're, where they're coming from. Back in the 90s, when they, our opposition called us pirates, I said, okay, well, if you want us to be pirates, we'll be pirates, and got our own pirate flag, and, you know, you just flip it around and make it work, make it work for you. But um, our clients are the life that's in the ocean. It's not people, so criticisms about what we do don't really impact us very much. Uh, people join us to make a difference, we don't join them. So uh, we're not like St. Paul where we're all things to all people. You know? <laughs> if, if you could kind of give one piece of advice to, to anybody listening in terms of what they can do personally uh, to go about trying to conserve as much of this biodiversity that we've talked about, conserve as much of the, the environment that we have and, and try and put a stop to uh, the worst effects of climate change, what would your, what would your kind of steer be? Well, my advice to anybody is to find out what are you passionate about and then what are your skills, what are your abilities, harness those skills and abilities to the virtue of courage and uh, imagination and go for it and don't be deterred by anybody saying you can't go for it. There's so many young people today that are actually championing different causes and making a difference and one person can, can change the world. Um, because of Diane Fossey, we still have mountain gorillas in Rwanda. Because of David Wingate, the Bermuda storm petrel in Bermuda did not go extinct. Look what Greta Thunberg has uh, accomplished uh, in delivering her message. Um, people can you know, change the world uh, if, if, if they're passionate enough. And uh, that's, what we, that's what I try to advise people is uh, that they can make a difference. And how about folks who want to get involved with Sea Shepherd directly? You know, how, how, how would you go about doing that? And what kind of things could you do to support Sea Shepherd? Well, people can uh, certainly uh, get in touch with us through our websites or through social media. And they can apply to be uh, crew members on the various ships or on shore campaigns. They can uh, work uh, for, on land as a support group for Sea Shepherd, or they can be involved financially to support what we're doing with the ships. So there's different levels of, of involvement. Uh, right now we have about 
240 volunteers from 25 different countries on 12 different ships. So they, um, you know, there's always room for people to get involved. I think we've had about 7,000 people crew on the ships over the, over the years in total. It's a pretty incredible number. And and some uh, both been around for a while. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, yeah, it, truly incredible. Uh, uh, Paul, it's been it's been amazing chatting with you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's um, uh, I think Sea uh has has brought an incredible spotlight onto uh, onto the plight of our oceans, and 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 importantly, I think has given people some uh, a direct kind of call to action. I've had so many conversations with folks who are. Uh, have inquired about you know what do I do to become vegan what does that look like how do I stop eating fish uh, so on and so forth as, as a result uh, so I thank you for that and all the incredible work that you've that you've done over the years well thank you I think Ali and uh, Lucy Tabrizi have done an incredible job with putting this film together and it's certainly it's having an impact and uh, no matter what the critics say uh, it is being very influential to millions of people thank you Paul thanks for your time Thank you.